Welcome back to everyone. We are a bit earlier, but I think we can start so that we have a little bit more time to, for discussion. Um, after the sessions of this morning, which were very productive in terms of exchanges of opinion and best practice, uh, we will go on with a session that I hope will be equally productive um, and we will discuss on best practices and policies to protect the most vulnerable, that is minorities, uh, minors, women, and LGBTI people. Um, the panel is made of distinguished members of PGA and experts that I think will provide us with ideas, suggestions on these specific themes, and then we will open up uh, the floor for discussion. First of all, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Fadi. Is, it, is everything all right? Is the translation working? Yes. I would like to give the floor to Dr. Fadi Sale who is a Syrian civil society expert on LGBT issues in the MENA region, and is currently working as a professor at the University of Göttingen in Germany. He will certainly present on this issue, which I think is at the top of concerns for those of us that work on LGBT rights. We tend to see at the MENA region for the conflicts, for the instability, and we tend to forget about the rights of people coming from a, an LGBT background, while we should have this topic in mind when we work on the region. So please, please Fadi, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, First of all, um, thank you for having me here, and I just want to apologize that I have a little sore throat, so I hope you can understand me well, you can hear me well, and apologies in advance. Um, uh, so, um, on Sunday, the 24th of November, that is two days ago, 14 men were sentenced to three years in jail for being gay in Egypt, while the trials of three others um, were delayed due to procedural um, reasons. This is only a small part of the recent unending crackdown of the Egyptian authorities on the Egyptian gay community after some people raised a rainbow flag at a concert on the 22nd of September um, this year. Since then, tens of people have been randomly arrested and some have even been subjected to the archaic and abusive practice of anal tests, a practice that is unfortunately still common in many uh, Middle Eastern North African countries allegedly through which one could discover if the person is gay or not. However, one of the most dangerous results of these mass arrests um, was that Riyad Abdel Sattar, a member of the Egyptian parliament, along with other members, submitted a draft law to criminalize what they call acts of homosexuality. The law encompasses five articles that criminalize consexual same-sex sexual activities in addition to criminalizing speaking in public or doing politics um, or even organizing parties um, uh, by LGBTI uh, people among others. Um, whereas the civil society and LGBTI organizations in Egypt have been pushing for more freedom of expression and more protection for LGBTI populations. Uh, members of the Egyptian parliament seem to believe that discriminatory laws need to be put in place in a country that has so far not had a explicit anti-gay laws. I mean, so far Egypt has depended on other laws to criminalize lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex persons like the anti-sex work law or inciting, inciting to debauchery or public morality laws. This drastic event is unfortunately not unique to Egypt. Um, recently, there has been a worrying rise in discrimination on the state level um, in different parts of the region. In Turkey, uh, only 10 days ago, uh, for example, the Ankara governor's office imposed a ban on all cultural LGBT 
I events in Ankara using arguments such as threats to public order and the fear of provoking um, certain segments of society as justifications for these measures. Um, also, consider this rather ironic scenario. The human rights minister of Morocco, Mustafa Al-Ramid, was caught on tape this last September calling gays in Morocco trash, or as human rights and feminist and gay rights organizations in Morocco preferred to translate it, he called a class of Moroccan citizens which supposedly enjoy the same constitutional rights and protections as everyone else in the country, trash. I start with these stories that directly implicate states and parliaments of Middle Eastern and North African countries because first, of course, of their suitability for the context of the Milan Forum of Parliamentarians for Global Action, and at the same time also because of their, rec their, their, their recent, they're fresh out of the oven. Um, yet you might be asking yourselves at this point, why is he not talking about ISIS or Daesh? the most prominent and circulated example of a perpetrator of mass atrocities and violent extremism against gay men, mostly. Well, maybe because the number of those arrested, discriminated, um, imprisoned, and sometimes killed over the years by the states that claim to grant equal rights to their citizens has far exceeded the number of people executed by Daesh over the last few years. The only major difference between the two is that Daesh kills violently and circulates the horrifying methods of its killing, while the states do not always kill, but they certainly render, render one's life or LGBT people's lives unbearable and unlivable through other methods that many other states could turn a blind eye to, because it doesn't amount to killing or to death. So Daesh circulates videos and images that reach the globe and have a shock factor that arouses um, people's emotions and allows them to project all of the problems of LGBTI people onto ISIS, while the states persecute in ways that do not trigger the same emotions um, because they're not bloody or violent enough. And that is a problem. So what I'm trying to point out here is this overemphasis on Daesh and media representations of extreme violence against allegedly gay men has resulted in completely ignoring the larger context in which Daesh operates. Um, for who has um, ever condemned Daesh for killing gays um, in the last three to four years in the Middle East and North Africa? No state has done that. Um, has Saudi Arabia or Egypt uh, done that? No. If states, and as we saw in the example of Egypt, are pushing to further legalize and institutionalize violence against LGBTI people, who do, why, why do people still wonder how Daesh or other extremist groups um, find legitimation or reasoning um, for their atrocities? If discrimination against LGBTI people in many MENA um, countries is enshrined in the law, one does not have to go to religious texts or culture or tradition um, in order or other sources to find validation for their violence, um, extremist or not. And this, of course, presents us with, with a, a problem. And, I mean, the solution to which tends to be quite difficult. I mean, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about what could be done, although this is a very thorny and difficult issue, because granted, the, the diversity of the MENA region and a variety of its systems of governance make this question really difficult. However, um, it, 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 it forces us to conduct um, rather nuanced analyses um, of the different legal, cultural, religious, and historical contexts within which these laws function and from which they derive their force, and then they become legitimation for even extremist groups um, 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 to use um, against LGBTI people. I think parliamentarians need to, to approach civil society actors directly and carefully, of course, in their local contexts, in order to listen to their needs, demands, and the best ways of applying pressure on governments, especially using human rights frameworks and the framework of frameworks of international law or contexts such as the Human Rights Council um, in order to amplify the voices of those on the ground while, of course, always ensuring their safety. And um, a successful example of this, uh, just to be also on the positive side of things, um, is the recent case of Tunisia where the Human Rights Minister accepted recommendations by the UN and the EU to end the uh, brutal practice of anal tests um, in Tunisia. 
Moreover, understanding that the way we frame certain issues, I mean, at least LGBTI issues, um, should really depend on the context in which we're talking about these things. And in this sense, I'm particularly thinking about Syria. Um, because, for example, um, in Syria, you cannot really easily speak of, of granting rights and protections to individuals at this point, because that's more of a vision or a dream than a possible reality. Um, because to fight for rights, one needs a country, a state, and a system that grants rights, or at least allows the space for one to fight or ask for rights without constantly being threatened by jail or torture. Of course, this applies to other countries as well. Um, well, at this point, maybe in a country like Syria, where I come from, um, protection and safety measures might be the only option or the only thing we could highlight or focus on, which is why I do urge parliamentarians, especially of asylum-granting countries, to realize that there is a vast difference between media representations of the benevolent West claiming to open its arms to all LGBTI asylum seekers and the reality of the high numbers of rejections of LGBT asylum cases that we hear of and read about frequently. To conclude, maybe, countering extremist violence and mass atrocities against LGBTI people, as well as other groups, must take into account the many legal, social, cultural, and religious factors that furnish the ground for such extremist violence to validate itself in the first place. And at the same time, thorough and sustained critique of the humanitarian institutions and asylum laws in many asylum granting countries is indispensable to the task of supporting many LGBTI persons in their fight for recognition, acceptance, and building more inclusive environments on the national, regional, and international levels. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paddy, for the suggestions and the points of attention. Um, I would give the floor now to Ronnie Monge Salas from Costa Rica, which is Secretary of the Special Committee on Security and Narcotics, Vice, Vice Chair of the Commission on Full Legislative Powers, and uh, member of PGA. Muy buenas tardes a todos y todas. Gracias a PGA por tenernos una vez más acá reunidos a legisladores de todo el mundo y gracias a Italia por recibirnos el día de hoy. No estamos acá por casualidad, no estamos acá por un encuentro parlamentario más. Estamos acá porque nos preocupa el presente y el futuro de la humanidad. Nos preocupa el extremismo, el extremismo violento que ha sacudido a la humanidad y que ha sacudido a nuestras naciones. Entendiendo el extremismo violento como esa cultura del terror, esa cultura de miedo. No se trata de religiones, no se trata de Occidente, no se trata de Oriente, no se trata de hombres ni se trata de mujeres, se trata de sembrar el terror entre cada uno de los seres humanos que habitamos la tierra. Y ese extremismo es peor cuando a veces es silencioso. Y aquí me refiero cuando hablamos de silencioso. Y quizás para eso es importante hacer un repaso por la historia de la humanidad y recordar cómo los derechos que hoy podemos ostentar muchos de nosotros es producto del resultado de la concentración y la expansión de personas que lideraron luchas en cada uno de nuestros países. Y nos podemos remontar hace un par de siglos atrás, donde una revolución civil en Estados Unidos dio como fruto la eliminación de la esclavitud o las luchas que se han dado a través de los años para que las mujeres no solo tengan participación política, sino que tengan la oportunidad de poder insertarse realmente dentro de una sociedad que le dé oportunidades igual que las que han tenido los hombres por muchos años. O también hablamos de esa oportunidad de darle a las personas con discapacidad la accesibilidad no solo a los edificios, sino a las oportunidades de educación, sino también a las oportunidades de poder integrarse a una sociedad que no los ve como diferentes, sino que son parte de un entorno donde todos tenemos que construir una patria equitativa. Y por supuesto, hablamos de ese extremismo silencioso, como pasa en nuestra área en Centroamérica, 
donde las personas por su orientación o su identidad sexual son víctimas de asesinatos atroces solo por su orientación o por su identidad sexual. Y no podemos tampoco dejar de señalar el extremismo cuando seguimos viendo a las mujeres en muchos países como mercancías y permitimos el matrimonio infantil muchas veces pactado y negociado dentro de las familias para que una niña sea entregada a un adulto mayor cuando no tiene la capacidad de discernir ni escoger cuál es el camino que quiere para su futuro. A ese extremismo violento también nos enfrentamos hoy en, nuestro, en nuestra tierra, en nuestro planeta. Y a ese también tenemos que combatir porque muchas veces es silencioso. Muchas veces es tan silencioso que pasa frente a nuestros ojos, sucede en cada uno de nuestros países o en nuestros países hermanos y seguimos guardando silencio. Ese silencio que produce la impunidad de saber que no hacemos nada para seguir logrando campañas como la que impulsa PGA para la erradicación del matrimonio infantil. No podemos seguir permitiendo que las personas simplemente por su orientación, por su identidad sexual, sean discriminadas, sean rechazadas y sean casi que despreciadas de oportunidades de trabajo y de convivio con todos como si fuéramos personas diferentes. PGA tiene una obligación y nosotros como legisladores del mundo de entender que esto no puede pasar desapercibido, que las luchas que damos no solo son porque son derechos que son inherentes, porque son derechos humanos, los cuales si uno se pusiera a pensar diría ¿por qué estamos dando luchas por cosas que son inherentes a nosotros como seres humanos? Pero la realidad nos ha dicho que aunque la mujer y el hombre son iguales, ha habido que dar una lucha porque esos derechos se consoliden. Y tenemos que seguir haciendo y tomando acciones afirmativas en nuestros parlamentos para que las mujeres tengan acceso a las diputaciones, a los ministerios y a las posibilidades de tomar decisiones en nuestras patrias. En nuestro país hemos iniciado una campaña de lo, lo que se llama gobierno paritario. Para las próximas elecciones, todas las nóminas a las diputaciones en todos los partidos políticos tendrán que tener paridad vertical y horizontal. Eso significa hombre, mujer, mujer, hombre, pero además, como hay siete provincias, al menos cuatro mujeres o tres mujeres deben encabezar las papeletas en cada una de las provincias, permitiéndole aún más asegurarse una participación más efectiva de las mujeres. Nosotros tenemos que seguir luchando también para que en nuestros parlamentos, a pesar de que no sea un tema que genere muchas veces réditos electorales, reivindicar las, los derechos de las personas LGBTI. No podemos seguir pensando que podemos equiparar derechos o algunos tipos de garantías civiles con los derechos que son inherentes a las personas. No podemos crear desigualdades donde no las hay. El siglo XXI es el siglo de la información, el, el, el siglo de la comunicación y eso nos implica a estar en pleno contacto con, las, con la sociedad civil organizada. Tenemos que reunirnos con los grupos organizados de mujeres, tenemos que reunirnos con los grupos organizados de las personas con discapacidad, tenemos que reunirnos con las personas de la comunidad LGBTI. Gracias a PGA hemos tenido la oportunidad de tener un contacto directo con las comunidades del FTI en Costa Rica. Y si bien es cierto, no avanzamos en la, con la velocidad que la comunidad quisiera, seguimos dando pasos. Y estoy seguro que en el corto plazo estaremos más cerca de construir una sociedad más equitativa, más igualitaria y más inclusiva. Ese es el reto que tenemos. Ese es el reto que tenemos cuando tenemos que visualizar que nadie, absolutamente nadie, en nuestras comunidades, en nuestros países, en este planeta, se puede quedar atrás. La igualdad no se trata de que todos vivamos iguales. La igualdad se trata de no dejar a nadie atrás. Y yo creo que podemos hacerlo. Creo que es nuestra responsabilidad con el mundo, con nuestros compatriotas, con los seres humanos, con mujeres, con niños, con personas de la comunidad LGBTI, con personas con discapacidad, 
el tiempo de las minorías como, como sectores excluidos de nuestra sociedad debe quedar en el pasado. Y por eso quiero permitirme cerrar leyendo una parte de una poesía de un poeta costarricense que se llama Jorge de Bravo, porque creo que el mundo cambió, las naciones cambiaron y nosotros cambiamos. Decía el poeta costarricense, creo en el corazón del hombre, creo que es de pura caricia, a pesar de las manos que a veces asesinan sin saberlo y que manejan fusiles sanguinarios. Creo en la libertad a pesar de los cepos, a pesar de los campos alambrados. Creo en la paz amada a pesar de las bombas y los cascos. Creo que los países serán un solo sitio de amor para los hombres y las mujeres, a pesar de los pactos, a pesar de los límites, a pesar de los cónsules, a pesar de los libres que se crean como esclavos. Yo creo que ya no solo nos preocupa el presente y el futuro de la humanidad, creo que nosotros tenemos el poder y la posibilidad en cada uno de nuestros países en asegurar que nuestro presente y el futuro sea inclusivo y mejor para cada uno de los compatriotas del mundo. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Ronnie. Uh, I think that uh, the best advocates for women's rights and minority rights are actually male, and you really gave a, a stark example of that. So I thank you very much also for, for, for being a true witness. I give the floor to Petra Bayer, which is, um, of course, our treasurer, but uh, is also uh, the chairperson of the International Development Committee of the Austrian Parliament. Thank you very much, Leah. Um, I assume that the most of you are aware about the existence of the Sustainable Development Goals with its 17 goals ranging from eradication of poverty and hunger, coming up to providing education, health services, gender equality, and also covering some very important goals on environmental issues but also, for instance, in its goal number 16, uh, demanding for access to justice for everybody. These 17 goals have 169 targets, and there are another 232 indicators to measure the progress of, of in, introducing um, the SDGs, and uh, they act as a kind of guiding star for the development of the world until the year 2030. And beside these goals and targets and indicators, there are also three enshrined principles in this Agenda 2030. And these three principles are firstly the universality, that means that they should be applied to all countries in the world. The second principle is the principle that we really would need some normative shifts to reach these goals. That means shifts in values and shifts in systems. And the third guiding principle is the idea, and Ronnie already mentioned it, to leave no one behind. No one behind. And I think when we talk about uh, the protection of rights of minorities, of vulnerable groups, then we really have to bear both the goals, but ex especially these principles in our mind, because without shifts of values, we wouldn't get any further. Um, for instance, it is of course a shift of value when we start to foster the social uh, status of women, which is nowhere better than the one of men. And it is a, an, indeed a, a shift of values if we work against neglecting and marginalization of these groups. It's a shift in values when we speed up our efforts for empowerment for women, children, LGBTIQ persons, and also it's a shift of value if we try to eradicate every discrimination in in our laws, but also in our behavior, and maybe the most uh, hard to reach target um, in the minds of people. 
So we have to do that everywhere in the world because there is not a single country in this world that, which is free of discrimination, of disadvantages and prejudices against specific groups. Uh, measures, activities and many different levels and commitments are necessary to make this world a better place to live for everybody in peace, in security, in dignity, in health, in wealth, in self-determination, in uh, global solidarity, enjoying all the human rights that are available for everybody. And um, I'd like to pick out now one uh, of the fields where I am acting in Austrian parliament for many years, um, where I try to, to foster these rights. And I would like to, to focus on uh, female genital mutilation as a human rights violation. Due to migration, uh, FGM, female genital mutilation, um, also came to Europe and, and um, is also practiced in European countries. Um, and I have to say that FGM is about 5,000 years old. It's a kind of tradition. It's a kind of extreme manifest manifestation of patriarchal structures. And because it's so old, it's much older than any religion we know nowadays. So it's not founded in any religion um, we know. Uh, and it's independent of social status, education, rural or, or, or not rural areas. And it's, it's find its fundaments in uh, questionable values, in misunderstanding, and the wrong belief that uh, girls who undergone female genital mutilation have a better position for getting a husband. They, uh, they are assumed to be clean and, and faithful and better mothers. Um, obviously, um, that when we deal with a human rights infringement like FGM, we need a multi-level and an, a very diverse approach. And one of these approaches, of course, um, is legislation. In Austria, we adopted a bundle of, of uh, um, changes in laws to eliminate FGM, especially um, with the intention to prevent it, not so much to punish, punish it, much more to prevent it. FGM always in Austria has been um, a grievous bodily harm, uh, mostly with heavy lasting consequences. And under the Austrian penal code, in general, it's not only for FGM, of course, um, we know three kinds of perpetrators. It's the, the acting perpetrator, it's the perpetrator who is assisting, and it's the perpetrator who, um, who makes the incitement for the offense, and that often are the parents of the child. And all these three kinds of perpetrators have to fear punished in the same way. They can't be punished with the same um, um, yeah, punishment. Um, so, um, uh, the offense will also be pursued if it is committed abroad, and we know in Austria, for instance, that about 95% of all cases are committed abroad, often uh, during holidays, during summer holidays, when the family go to their country of origin. And um, it also can be pursued if the victim agrees, which very often is not the case, but in theory, even if the victim agrees, it is still an infringement of, of bodily integrity um, and has to be prosecuted. At the law on criminal procedure, we also strengthened the rights of the victims. Um, we enlarged the, the limitation periods extremely, so you can, you can bring a, a case to court uh, even 30 years after you had your 28th birthday, so really a very long time. Um, and we also strengthened the rights of victim in this way that you can get physical, uh, psycho psychologically and, and legal assistance during the whole process for free. And um, there are also other victim rights which were enlarged and enforced. It. Medical personnel is obliged to report fresh FGM cases to police, but also to ch children and youth protect welfare institutions and also the institutions that uh, work with uh, victims and foster victim uh, rights. Um, and FGM also can justify as asylum in Austria. So we can say that from a legal standpoint, the situation is quite perfect. The problem is we do not have 
one single case at court, and we know that FGM also occurs in Austria. And as legislators, of course, we know that the law alone doesn't change anything. It's always a question of proper enforcement, and here we still have a lot to do. We need information among affected groups, but also among those societies that might commit uh, the crime. Um, we see that there is a need of education in families, not only about the legal situation, but also for the harm that causes uh, FGM for girls and, and for um, women, physically and psychologically. And so because of that, in 2003, so 15 years ago nearly, I founded the Austrian platform Stop FGM to bring together all relevant stakeholders like African and Asian societies, teachers, medical personnel, law enforcement organizations, faith-based institutions, medi 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 medical institutions, um, and of course other NGOs who are working on human rights enforcement. This platform, initiated, for instance, a survey among doctors and midwives about their knowledge about FGM, because we saw at the survey that there is very limited knowledge among the doctors. The, the midwives were quite well informed, but not the doctors. We offered seminars and workshops. We initiated encounters between social workers, kindergarten teachers, judges, uh, and others that each of other knows the situation of the other and each, everybody knows his or her obligations, what she has to do to be become better connected. We really try to build a very strong network in Austria uh, fighting FGM. We offered uh, also surgery training for gynecologists in, in, in hospitals that they know how to deal with FGM before or after a delivery from a medical standpoint. We worked together with painters and with street artists to ra raise awareness in public space. We um, cooperate, of course, also with other um, international organizations dealing with the issue, exchange views, learn from each other, and of course, contribute to international service. Even if the platform now is 15 years old if, and it has really very intensive work, there is still a lot to do, both for civil society and also for the law enforcement organizations. And um, even if women and girls affected by FGM uh, in Austria are a very small minority, we assume it's between five to 6,000 women affected, even if it's a very small group, of course, it's an obligation for us to care about this very limited uh, group of, of, of women, um, and to undertake everything to prevent this human rights violation in future. The idea to leave no one behind um, is um, both an assignment and a desire in the case of fighting FGM. And of course, as parliamentarians, uh, we are in a very extreme important position to contribute to this, uh, to this fight, to the, to the um, enforcement of human rights, and really to turn the tide and try to make uh, the world a better place for everybody to live, even if it's a very tiny minority, but also these have the right, of course, to enjoy their full human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Petra, for this specific example that uh, can inspire also our actions uh, back home. And finally, I give the floor to Karina Sosa, which is a member of parliament of the Parliament of El Salvador, and there she is chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Gracias, congresista Lía. Un saludo a quienes integran el panel junto a mí en esta oportunidad. Un, un agradecimiento muy especial al um, Parlamento italiano que ha facilitado que podamos estar debatiendo este, en esta jornada que ya es, llevamos segundo día, temas de tanta importancia para el mundo y, por supuesto, para todos y cada uno de nuestros países. Comparto con el colega Ronnie de Costa Rica que estos temas debiésemos darle mucho más interés del que le damos muy probablemente en nuestros países. Por eso también quiero hacer un reconocimiento a Parlamentarios para la Acción Global porque ha hecho como parte de su agenda justamente el abordaje de estos temas que aparentemente pudiesen ser insignificantes en nuestras sociedades. No digo en todas, pero 
en muchas de nuestras sociedades pudiese ser insignificante hacer un abordaje de los temas que tienen que ver con minorías que históricamente han estado abandonadas. Y aquí sí recalcar que a pesar de que muchos de ellos son votantes, en muchas de nuestras sociedades son invisibles. Y me refiero a mujeres, a personas con discapacidad, a personas adultas mayores incluso, a personas LGTBI, a niñas, niños, adolescentes. Me refiero también a migrantes y a personas refugiadas, que yo creo que todos estos temas deben ser un reto para todos y cada uno de los parlamentarios a fin de promover muchas más iniciativas legislativas a favor de ellos, pero no solo promover iniciativas y quedarnos hasta ahí. Creo que es sumamente importante el seguimiento que podamos darle ya una vez se hayan aprobado estas iniciativas y se constituyen en una ley o en una modificación a la ley. Debemos de garantizar esa aplicación. Quiero compartir brevemente con ustedes, que me parece sumamente importante, la experiencia que recientemente hemos vivido en El Salvador. El año pasado en Senegal compartía en el foro con ustedes que estábamos y teníamos pendiente de aprobar una iniciativa que buscaba prohibir el matrimonio infantil. Lamentablemente en ese momento nuestra legislación era incongruente y chocaba. El Código Penal del Salvador castigaba, sancionaba, penalizaba el abuso en niñas hasta los 15 años, catalogándolo como violación. De ahí hasta los 18 como estupro. Tenía pena. Sin embargo, el Código de Familia facilitaba el matrimonio. En las causales del matrimonio, Decía de que estaba prohibido a menores, pero ponía excepciones abajo. Y una de ellas es que la niña pudiese estar embarazada o tuvieran una vida en común. Esto facilitaba mucho burlar las sanciones que tenía el Código Penal para violadores y abusadores de niñas. Y entonces perfectamente, en lugar de aplicársele el Código Penal, se casaban con ellas. Y quiero hacer también un énfasis en ese rol que debieron haber tenido, pero sin embargo no tuvieron los juzgadores en mi país. Nosotros somos un país de los, del mundo entero que hemos ratificado la Convención de los Derechos del Niño. Y según nuestra Constitución, tiene supremacía sobre la ley secundaria. Sin embargo no se le daba tal supremacía y entonces se aplicaba la excepción del Código de Familia, ignorando que la Convención de los Derechos del Niño regula derechos, principios, deberes, obligaciones del Estado para con la niñez y para resguardar esos derechos. Nos dimos cuenta durante el debate que tardó un poco más de un año en nuestra comisión que había un grupo considerable también de niñas que estaban saliendo embarazadas. El año pasado en El Salvador hubo cerca de 25 mil niñas embarazadas. Mi país es pequeño. En mi país tenemos una cantidad de 6 millones de salvadoreños en territorio salvadoreño y más de 3 millones de salvadoreños en el mundo, o sea, salvadoreños migrantes. Pero hemos tenido el, el caso de tener 25 mil niñas embarazadas. A muchas de ellas fue posteriormente, posteriormente haberse casado, salud, posterior a casarse. Pero ¿qué significa en El Salvador que las niñas se casaran y que salieran embarazadas? Abandonaban sus estudios. Nosotros debemos pensar qué significa para una niña después ser mujer después ser madre soltera, después ser cabeza de hogar con un nivel académico bajo. Eso obviamente le genera un costo principalmente a la familia, pero también a nuestros países, porque estanca el desarrollo de nuestros países. En El Salvador, la mayoría de la población, la mayoría que están jefeando un hogar somos mujeres. Y si las mujeres no tenemos las mismas alternativas y posibilidades para salir adelante en la vida, al igual que los hombres, difícilmente nuestros países van a avanzar. 
Por tanto, un paso que parecía a lo mejor a criterio de algunos en nuestro país insignificante se convierta en vital y necesario para que El Salvador avance, igual el resto de países. Gracias a Dios hubo convencimiento sobre la necesidad de aprobar la prohibición. Gracias a PGA y agradezco a los parlamentarios de PGA que colaboraron con El Salvador. Estuvo el colega Ronnie hablándonos de la experiencia de Costa Rica para la prohibición del matrimonio infantil. Estuvo la senadora Soledad. Buen día, de Ecuador. Y también estuvo Gloria Reyes de República Dominicana, quienes compartieron su experiencia y créanme que fue sumamente importante y vital para el convencimiento de todos y cada uno de mis colegas. Por eso es que yo destaco la importancia que tiene que PGA tenga como parte de su agenda este tema. Sí impacta, sí incide. El Salvador es una muestra del trabajo de PGA en esta agenda que tiene que ver con trabajar a favor de las personas que están en minorías y como es el caso de las niñas que estaban en matrimonio infantil o en riesgo de llegar a matrimonio infantil. Agradezco mucho ese apoyo que nos dieron. Estamos hablando de la continuidad, no solo quedarnos con la aprobación, sino también con justamente verificar la aplicación. Pero hay un tema que aún tenemos pendiente, porque no basta solo con prohibir matrimonio infantil, hay que ver uniones matrimoniales también. No podemos dejar rendijas que permitan continuar violentando los derechos de las niñas adolescentes en nuestros países. Agradezco mucho su atención y si hay inquietudes acerca de cómo fue el proceso del de Salvador, con mucho gusto lo vamos a compartir y reitero a PGA por ese agradecimiento, por ese apoyo y acompañamiento que dio a mi país El Salvador. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Karina, for reminding us also how advancements in legislation uh, can actually change things in, in our countries. Um, I give the floor for interventions, and while I wait for you to suggest that you want to speak, I give the floor to Marina Calloni who is professor uh, at uh, university here in Milan, Università degli Studi di Bicocca. Mrs. Uh, President Quartapelle, thank you very much for the invitation because I'm learning a lot also from your presentations. On behalf of uh, Professor Maria Cristina Messa, Rector of the University of Milano Bicocca, I'm honored to share with such distinguished uh, audience the activities we have uh, developed in the last two years in support to the Yazidi community brutalized by the Daesh militiamen. I'm professor of social and political philosophy, working on human rights, gender issues, and now more because of the dramatic humanitarian crisis we are experienced in the Mediterranean Sea with new atrocities and forms of slavery. Our commitment as a university, as a public university, national university, is due to the conviction that the university can actively contribute to the struggle against any form of political, public, but also domestic violence, thanks to ad hoc teaching, research, third mission activities we have planned and we are trying to perform. Yet it's also crucial the role we can play as academics, researchers, activists in international missions aimed at promoting peace and assisting victims. Namely, Article 2 of our statute asserts that the goal of the university is also to contribute to the development of a culture grounded on the universal values of human rights peace, international solidarity, and the safeguarding of the environment. We are quite a new public university, 20 years old, but we have already 34,000 students, and we are very inclusive. In May 2016, the rector, Professor Messa, decided to accept the request of the association Yazda, which asked us to accommodate 10 students who were placed in refugee camps in North Iraq. 
Yadza is a multinational Yazidi global organization established after the aftermath of the Yazidi genocide. And uh, it's tried to support this ethno-religious uh, minority. And yesterday, there was a word of one uh, of uh, the lady who was uh, raped, as we know. On 15 September 2016, the University of Milano Bicocca welcomed those 10 Yazidi students in order to offer them the opportunity to restart their studies, tragically interrupted by the Daesh invasion of their country, followed by mass atrocities. During the first year of their stay, the Yazidi students attended Italian courses in order to learn our language, to feel better, and to settle peacefully in the new environment. They were and still are assisted by tutors and uh, colleagues who are uh, experts in the field uh, post-traumatic syndromes and, and who are trying to make less distressing their new life, considering the traumas and pains these students suffered in the last years. At the moment, we have, we host six Yazidi students. Four of them decided to leave one wanted to join his family in Germany, three decided to attend medicine in Iraq, six have chosen to stay and are now enrolled in our university and have started to attend regular courses. These students prefer to be enrolled as foreigner students and not as asylum seekers because of the hope they have to go back in the next future to their country and to embrace their relatives' families once the territory will be completely liberated from Daesh militants. The university is covering all maintenance costs of the Yazidi students. The interest for the Yazidis cause started on 4 May 2016 when we organized at the university conference with Nadia Murad, who was also mentioned yesterday with Lamia Ayi Bashar, within the frame of the Festival on Human Rights and thanks to the di director Di Biasio, and I'm part of the board of this festival, and I'm keen also to start also to collaborate with, uh, the, um, with uh, this organization, with parliamentarians. And uh, in particular, uh, also I'm working on gender issue and human rights. Like Lamia, also Nadia Murad was able to survive to the Daesh violence after being kidnapped, sexually enslaved, and sold to militants. The conference we organized had important effects. Indeed, we were able to arrange a meeting in Rome between Nadia Murad and, at that time, Deputy President of the Senate, Senator Valeria Fedeli, now appointed Ministry for Education, Research, and University. And after this encounter, and thanks also to the support of uh, Lia Quartapelle, I want really to thank for her efforts, and Honorable Pia Locatelli, who was also invited here, who was the chairwoman of the Committee for Human Rights at the Chambers of Deputies, the Italian Parliament took an important decision. The Senate and the Chamber of Deputies jointly promoted a motion for the recognition of the genocide of the Yazidi people, which was unanimously this motion approved in September 2016. This motion impl implies a clear commitment for the Italian government and for us as citizens. It is also a legacy for us as academics and researchers because uh, in this year we already organized uh, several initiatives with survivors uh, to the genocides uh, in Rwanda and in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Another project in favor of the Yazidi community was organized this year in May 2017s when we host an exhibition called Photographs of Life in Kanken Camp, realized by six women who are living in the refugees camp in Iraq, where uh, there, were, there are, uh, are 2,900 families. That is about uh, 18,000 people being victims of the Daesh violence. The exhibition was inaugurated by the Ministry of Defense, Roberta Pinotti, who supported the initiative in Iraq within the frame of an international humanitarian intervention for the protection of people victims of war. Through this picture from the camp, the photographers, resilient women, 
represented a not lost dignity of human beings, also the genocidarian violence and an extremist form of political theology tried to dehumanize de them, was uh, not able. Yet the sense of solidarity and compassion which uh, distinguish uh, humanity strongly remains, and we still, uh, we hope, uh, continue to remain. Despite the hospitality of Yazidi, the hospitality given to Yazidi students, our university is committed to develop humanitarian activities thanks to the expertise of our colleagues with aim at preventing mass atrocities and supporting victims. We are also proud to say that we can count to self-help stories and best practices related to asylum seeker students who completed their degrees at our university. In particular, it is important to mention the story of an African refugee student who was able to get Marina. in a few years a master's degree, then a PhD, and now is employed, I'm concluding, in a prestigious research center. So, Concluding, we are keen to reconfirm our commitment to promote human rights in teaching or teaching social, scientific, transnational action and uh, to be improved over time. Therefore, we are keen to, and honored to offer our collaboration to the Parliamentarium for Global Actions for the development of activities of common concern related to the promotion and respect of human rights against any form of violation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry for, for being mean, but uh, we know that uh, lots of no, no, people but, want... No, uh, but uh, I, I was no, uh, telling sorry. 10 minutes. Um, so. um, I think there is still an intervention uh, from uh, another member of the organizing committee. Already coming. Okay. okay. No? Yes? Yes, yes, yes. Go yes. Ahead, go ahead. Um, of the organizing committee, which is Yaniki Cingoli from CIPMO, uh, the Center for Initiative of, uh, uh, for Peace in the Middle East. Thank you, Ms. Quartapella, uh, and thank you, you for hosting me. In larga parte dell'area mediterranea e dell'Africa, la questione delle minoranze nazionali, etniche, linguistiche e religiose può dirsi un problema irrisolto. Ciò rappresenta un ostacolo all'effettivo superamento dei focolai di crisi e a una efficace stabilizzazione dell'intera regione. Nei paesi del sud mediterraneo le minoranze, spesso autoctone, vengono concepite come una presenza da tollerare e da controllare, nonché come un possibile fattore di indebolimento delle diverse realtà statuali. Si riscontra una difficoltà a riconoscere la stessa esistenza delle minoranze in quanto tali. Si afferma che si tratta di cittadini come tutti gli altri che non necessitano di riconoscimenti o tutele particolari. Eppure i problemi sono esplosivi, a partire dagli ultimi attentati di Boko Haram in, Alge in Nigeria e di Daesh nel Sinai, per non parlare del massacro degli Yazidi, richiamato ancora ieri sera ed ora dall'intervento della professoressa Palloni. Calloni. Eh, la questione è presente in Israele con la persistente tensione tra maggioranza ebraica e minoranza israelo-arabo-palestinese e in Turchia, dove si era acutizzata la questione kurda e parlare di questione armena significa ancora rompere un tabù. Ricordiamo le campagne dei migratori contro le minoranze musulmane in Europa, come si trattasse solo di immigranti da tenere a bada e non in molti casi di cittadini a pieno titolo, che chiedono di esercitare il loro diritto di libertà religiosa, o del diffondersi anche nel nostro continente di sentimenti di sempre più diffusi episodi antisemiti e palesi restano i problemi nella gestione dei Rom e dei Sinti, che pure con l'ingresso della Romania nell'Unione Europea sono cittadini europei. Al riguardo, già l'Assemblea Generale dell'ONU, 
con la dichiarazione del dicembre 1992, che era stata redatta dal professor Fausto Pocar, che abbiamo sentito ieri pomeriggio, aveva invitato a tutelare l'identità collettiva di tali minoranze, adottando misure positive per garantirne lo status e promuoverne la condizione. Tale concessione è stata ribadita nel 2008 dal Libro Bianco sul dialogo interculturale del Consiglio di Europa. Al riguardo, l'esperienza italiana rappresenta sicuramente una delle esperienze più avanzate al mondo, fondata sull'articolo 6 della Costituzione italiana, che sancisce che la Repubblica tutela con appositi norme le minoranze linguistiche. La condizione delle minoranze tedesca e ladina in Alto Adige, in particolare, vede tali minoranze riconosciute e garantite attraverso la concessione di una larga autonomia ratificata dall'ONU che le tutela con specifiche azioni positive nell'uso della lingua, nella gestione della scuola, nella distribuzione dei finanziamenti, nella garanzia di proporzionalità nel pubblico impiego e negli stessi organi rappresentativi. Si possono quindi enucleare tre principi generali. Non è sufficiente enunziare l'eguaglianza dei diritti di tutti i cittadini in quanto individui. I diritti delle minoranze possono così essere ignorati e messi in discussione dalle maggioranze. La protezione delle minoranze richiede, per essere effettiva, che venga assicurato un loro riconoscimento collettivo, comprensivo della loro identità e della loro storia. Essa postula inoltre l'adozione di specifiche misure positive di garanzia volte a salvaguardare la loro identità e il loro sviluppo. Su questi temi, con la provincia di Bolzano, nel corso del 2018, il CIPMO, Centro Italiano per la Pace in Medio Oriente, in collaborazione con la nostra antenna CIPMO a Bolzano, organizzerà un convegno a cui speriamo di eh, avere la presenza degli organizzatori di questa importante conferenza. Vi ringrazio. To Barbara Lockbiller, that is a member of the European Parliament and a PGA board member. Thank you. Thank you all for very excellent uh, statements. I have a question to Dr. Saleh from Syria. I work in the European Parliament. And um, as you uh, refer to different cases from the MENA region, Do you also have inside uh, information? How is the Arab League, for example, and their human rights debate on LGBTI rights, or also within the African Union? Is there a debate at all? And if so, what kind of? Because even we in the European Union, from the European Parliament side, we regularly have to remind uh, the civil servants of the European Union and the diplomats in let's say, the Gulf states, but also in the Maghreb, that they take up LGBTI rights. And they very often are reluctant because they know they cannot reach much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we collect a few questions and, com for, and comments for comments. Uh, I give the floor to Beriwan Ikailani, which is a member of parliament from Iraq. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Ch uh, Chairwoman and the panelists. Uh, actually, earlier the, uh, in the session, I was talking about what Professor Maria, Maria Marina talked about, uh, about how to rehabilitate, have a rehabilitation program, how to start those sort of programs for the victims uh, through the PGA. Uh, that's what I, I, I thought we, uh, we should establish a subcommittee uh, doing this sort of work. Uh, here, in the, Professor Marina talked about uh, victims, uh, the Yazidis victim only, and most of those ones are out, uh, the victims, the, the, they came 
Lots of them have been uh, moved into Europe, either to Germany or to Italy. And we still, we do have a lot of victims of, uh, uh, of this, um, uh, say, um, victims of uh, violence. We have victims of car explosions. We have victims of, uh, uh, among the refugees. How can we, the, the, my question is this, how can we expand these sort of programs, uh, working with universities through the P PGA and through member of parliaments who are uh, who, who are members in PA, uh, P, PGA. That was my, uh, my request, and I would love to hear from uh, Marina. How did she start this program? Uh, whom did uh, she work with in Iraq? Uh, because we do have a lot of, you know, like in Anbar, we do have a lot of people who had suffered quite a lot. We do have many people right now in the borderlines. They, they are uh, as much, they, they suffered as much as Yazidis as well. So we need to expand those sort of programs because we are already uh, getting rid of uh, ISIS and uh, we have uh, liberated most of the areas. So that's why these, these programs are so important for rehabilitations of uh, our victims. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I leave the floor now to Honorary, Honorable Shirley Osborne, which is a member of parliament, but also speaker of parliament of Montserrat. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Um, thank you very, very much. I am um, excited, actually, that we're having this conversation because of you, some of you remember from this morning that my concern was that we were leaving women out of the conversation. Now, uh, a couple of points I would like to make. Um, we talk of women as victims. We talk of protecting and saving women and children. And I want to suggest that one of the things that we ought to start doing is changing the language about how we speak, A, about women, and B, about victims. Um, women are not a minority. We are not. And so we need to stop using the word minority when we talk about women. Just dispense with it. And um, what I know from dealing with women who have had um, painful lives is that when we speak of them and speak to them always as victims, we continue the disempowerment of them. So I think one of the things that we ought to be looking at is how to acknowledge what has happened with them. It's awful, it's horrible, it's painful, we want to change it. But, and in order to do that, we need to empower not just ourselves to support them, but them to respond to, to absorb, to engage in the support that we give them. And I want to make one other point about women. And like I said this morning, I don't want to add something, another responsibility to women. But we can't talk of children and not talk about women. I have a sister who's a pediatrician, and she tells me that children are sociopaths. She tells me that at, about 30, at three years old, about 30% of children fit the criteria for, for, soci for sociopaths. Uh, the difference what makes them not turn out to be is precisely because they have mostly mothers, mostly women who teach them um, about remorse and about um, causing pain to other people. And you see them, they kick and shove but without, with no remorse whatsoever. But there are women, mostly women in their lives, who train them, who teach them um, beyond this. Now, even with women in refugee camps, in Jordan last year, I got to meet some women from Syria. and. Um, even in refugee camps, it's important that we continue, we find ways to empower women, and often all we have is language. And so I think we ought to focus a lot on using language. And lastly, I know I said this, but lastly, one of the things, one of the rights that has been curtailed for all of us is the right to travel. Uh, an, an Egyptian man, um, young man, on Facebook a couple of weeks ago, asked about coming to Montserrat to live. Immediately, one gentleman who is English, who only moved to Montserrat like a year ago, said, I see you're looking for, it seems you're looking for a place to be a citizen. Montserrat's not the place. We've had three Syrian young men over the last couple of years arrive in Montserrat. Now, bear in mind, you have to come through Europe, go through America, go through uh, three or four places before you get to Montserrat. 
And we've always had Syrians and Lebanese and Middle Eastern people living in the Caribbean from ever. These three men were sent back. They were young men who might very well have been looking for a safe place to be. The conversation was, if there were women, if they had a wife and children, it wouldn't be a problem. Now, who's to tell that these young men were not also looking for safe space themselves? And they were 22, 23. They were not much more than children, really. So, and, and, and with them, again, part of what we need to do with the men, with the young men, is use a language of empowerment, of support, of, support, of building up, uh, if we are to help them also get through this, which I think is, is, is critical. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I give the floor now to Deputé Pris Cyprien from Haiti. Merci, uh, Présidente. Uh, J'interviens cet après-midi pour uh, parler de deux des problématiques que vous avez soulevées particulièrement la problématique de la femme et aussi la question euh, des enfants. Et c'est vrai qu'il est un petit peu difficile de considérer ces deux entités comme des minorités, puisque d'une part, la femme elle est la mère de l'humanité, et d'autre part, l'enfant, c'est l'homme en devenir, c'est l'adulte en devenir. Mais toutefois, chez nous en Haïti, on a abordé la question sous plusieurs angles. Depuis 1982, nous avons résolu euh, la question euh, des droits des femmes parce qu'on avait pris euh, un décret pour reconnaître l'égalité des hommes et des femmes en Haïti. Et tout récemment, avec la convention Belém d'Opara qui a été signée euh, à Belém, euh, au Brésil, nous avons ratifié cette convention sur euh, la violence faite contre les femmes. Donc on a résolu dans un premier temps, ce problème. Ensuite, euh, concernant les enfants, ça a été un cheminement sur la reconnaissance euh, des droits des enfants, euh, particulièrement les différents types d'enfants légitimes, naturels ou adultérins. On a résolu aussi, aussi ce problème dans le droit haïtien, parce que depuis, euh, euh, pour la question des enfants, dans le Code civil haïtien, on a enlevé cette disparité qui existait entre divers types d'enfants, depuis 2014, nous avons voté une nouvelle loi pour l'égalité de tous les enfants, conformément euh, à la Convention sur les droits de l'enfant du 20 novembre 1989, qu'on a signée et qu'on a ratifiée depuis 1994. Donc je pense qu'à ce niveau-là, nous, nous avons fait un grand pas dans le cadre du droit haïtien pour la protection des femmes et aussi pour la protection des enfants. Merci. I don't have any other request for intervention. So if there isn't anyone who would like, David. Thank you, thank you very much. Of course, I also want to say that the plan of action in French arrived, so all of you should have a, the draft plan of action in front of you. I just want to point out something that for me is very important. We in PGA never considered women and children as minorities. So if you misread the title and you're entitled to do so, we apologize for the mistake. For us, it is about speaking about the basis of vulnerability that are used in society to victimize members of societies, whether they belong to minority groups or even to majority groups, because women uh, by no mistake, are a majority. They're not a minority, vis-a-vis -vis male. So that was our intention. It, our intention was to point out that there are vulnerabilities which are exploited in the social context. But we don't support them. We want to fix them. We want them to be addressed. Thank you, David. Um, I would give now the possibility to the speakers to react to the questions, maybe starting from the end, 
to the beginning. So, Marina, I think there was a specific question yeah, addressed uh, to you. Two questions. One is related to what uh, we can do, what we do as a university. I mean, since uh, uh, the globalization uh, has uh, started, the university has to face not only uh, its uh, traditional role, teaching and research, but also to deal with third mission and uh, international cooperation. So, third mission, for instance, we worked also with the network of uh, Latin American consulates in Milan because of the crisis also of uh, migrants. Um, then about the international programs as uh, researchers, we have started also to work in my case with uh, survivor to the genocide and just to host also the student because we think that we can do something. So to put, to be inclusive, and uh, to give the possibility to these uh, student people to reinforce. And now is the most problem uh, is related to the uh, Mediterranean humanitarian crisis. I'm working with other colleagues about the right of identification of migrants uh, that, uh, who died at sea. And so we have a lot of challenges as uh, citizen and the research. So we are trying to be inclusive and to develop also program. About the issue of victims, I would say that uh, uh, I would like to discouple the fact that to say that a woman was victimized as being a woman because Nadia Murad and her friend were raped because women. And Nadia Murad's mother was killed because she was 45 years and she could have been sold. So, I mean, the fact that to be a victim, it does not mean that these women are strong social um, uh, actors and able of responsibility and agency, but because as women, they were victimized, raped, kidnapped, and so on. And so we have, uh, just to show this uh, difference, because already in Beijing in 1995, it was clear that also uh, all women, also from uh, non-Western countries, they wanted to have their voices, and not just to from also the maternalism of uh, Western feminism. So I think that uh, we have to think that we have a lot of victims. We have never seen so many victims after the end of the World War II. And we as Mediterranean country is for us um, a huge task just to deal with drama and uh, also try to avoid the fact to see again victims because minorities, because women, because children, because trafficked and tortured human beings. Thank you. Karina, Karina. Quiero decir que me gusta ver mujeres empoderadas y hombres también en la defensa de los derechos de las mujeres. Um, El tema que nos tiene acá en este panel, en la redacción, habla de dos situaciones, no de una sola. Habla de minorías y poblaciones con mayor grado de vulnerabilidad. Pero a la hora de intervenir, teníamos que hacer un abordaje de ambos grupos, de las minorías y de las personas con vulnerabilidad. Quizás eso generó un poco la confusión en cuanto al abordaje del tema. Y estoy de acuerdo y puse el ejemplo de mi país donde las mujeres somos mayoría. Sin embargo, hay una gran diferencia para que realmente podamos ejercer como mayoría. ¿Y cuál es nuestro rol como parlamentarios? Ir poniendo gradas jurídicas o acciones que coadyuven o contribuyan a que efectivamente en nuestros países exista igualdad jurídica, que esa mayoría de mujeres en El Salvador esté tan, o quizás ojalá que así fuera, más empoderada que los hombres. Ese es el reto que tenemos, porque aunque somos mayoría, yo voy y visito las comunidades de mi país y no existe ese empoderamiento como mayoría. Yo desearía que las mujeres en mi país estuviesen empoderadas como tal. Pero entonces, ¿cuál es mi rol como parlamentaria? Y eso es parte del debate que tenemos que hacer. Hemos dado pasos significativos en el mundo y en nuestro país también, que yo pudiese hablar otros 15 minutos de acciones jurídicas a favor de las mujeres y de otro tipo de acciones en el caso de El Salvador. Sin embargo, compartí una parte que me pareció sumamente importante que estaba relacionada con 
garantizar esa igualdad, por ejemplo, en el caso de las niñas y adolescentes. Pero quería clarificar, porque hemos mezclado dos situaciones en este panel y me pongo completamente de acuerdo que las mujeres eh, debemos de tener un mayor empoderamiento y para eso estamos debatiendo esta tarde y continuaremos debatiendo este tema que no se va a acabar, no se va a acabar, al menos hasta que lleguemos a la igualdad jurídica. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Karina. And uh, at the same time, we welcome uh, the Archbishop, Monsignor Mario Del Pini, who just arrived. I give the floor to Ronnie for his reactions. Gracias. Yo creo que quizás eh, a veces parte de la intolerancia y que nos volvemos fundamentalistas es cuando no logramos comunicarnos. Y creo que ahí es donde nosotros tenemos que tener los espacios necesarios para clarificar a qué nos referimos. Las mujeres no son minoría, en mi país también son mayoría, pero es un grupo vulnerable. Un grupo vulnerable que hasta hace 60 años no votaba. Un grupo vulnerable que hasta hace 20 años por primera vez presidió el Congreso y solo dos veces ha presidido el Congreso en la historia de mi país. Un grupo vulnerable que hasta hace siete años tuvimos la primera mujer presidenta de la República y fue juzgada no como presidenta, sino en su condición de mujer y se le atacó duramente. Tan duramente que escuchábamos frases de personas que decían no podemos volver a votar por mujeres. Y yo recuerdo gobiernos de hombres mucho más tétricos, mucho más eh, aberrantes, que nos llevaron a crisis económicas y sociales más grandes y nunca escuché la frase, no hay que volver a votar por hombres. Y cuando hablamos de eso es cuando hablamos de empoderar y dar y hacer acciones afirmativas para que las mujeres tengan acceso a eso. Y pero sobre todo, donde los hombres hablemos de eso, no solo las mujeres. El problema que se ha dado mucho en nuestra Latinoamérica es que las mujeres, hablando de los derechos de las mujeres, en el tanto nosotros los hombres no entremos en una concientización de que tenemos que ir a dar esa lucha, siguen perdiendo. ¿Por qué? Porque yo he tenido compañeros en mi asamblea legislativa que me han dicho, ¿por qué vos hablando en defensa de las mujeres? Y es muy sencillo, porque yo no necesito ser mujer, no necesito ser niño, no necesito ser de la comunidad LGBTI para saber que tienen derechos. Y los derechos, independientemente del de género, de la identidad sexual, de si es discapacitado o no, se respetan. Y la obligación y el rol de los parlamentarios en cualquier parte del mundo es hacer que se respeten los derechos de todas las personas sin ningún distingo. Gracias, Ronnie, una vez más. Petra. Yeah, thank you. I would like to reflect to do issues tackle, uh, raised um, first to my colleague Berrivan Kailani, um, and I do that now in my capacity as treasurer of PGA. Um, as PGA, we will never be able to fund a rehabilitation program because we do not have the means to do so. Uh, what we can do or what is our task is to empower parliamentarians and help to create a political environment that such Uh, programs can be settled, that such programs can be done, but we cannot do it by ourselves, we just can assist. And we even can do our work in empowering parliamentarians, organizing encounters, bringing, sharing knowledge with them if we have uh, the funding for that. And that's not always the case, so we, it's a, a, a hard part of our work just to struggle for the funding of the work we are doing with parliamentarians. That was the first um, thing I wanted to explain. And, um, I also wanted to get back to, to, Shirley, to Shirley Osborne. Of course, we are no minorities. We are 52% of the population of this world. Um, and that's good uh, that it is like that. Even more, uh, even more I hear, okay. Um, in BGA, we are 
Not when it comes to members. So all, all females in the room who are not members of PJA, please feel free to, all the men of course as well, feel, feel free to, to, to become a member. Um, but what I, I wanted to underline once more, on the one hand, I think it's really this idea of these normative shifts to change the, the social status of women, to give women uh, half, not, not only half of the, of the, of the cookies, but half of the bakery, uh, if you know what I mean. And um, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, the, the, a better social status of women will only go hand in hand by uh, economic independence. Only if women are economically independent and if they can take decisions also on money, on land, on inheritance, on whatever, on themselves, then we will start to increase their social status as well. And there is, of course, a lot to do on that. And also because I think it's so important what you mentioned, the question of language. Um, I really can underline that as well. I'm also um, a vice president of International Planned Parenthood Federation uh, of Europe, and we know that when we, for instance, talk about um, legal access to secure abortion, that makes a very different pictures in, 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 in the minds of, of person as if you talk about uh, self-determination or if you talk about um, uh, sexual and reproductive rights, which is a very technical term and nobody will understand it. So I agree totally that we have to think a lot about our wording, about our language, because that's really key um, how, how far we can get and how, how we convincing we can be. And so I think the, 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 what is called framing is really indeed a very important issue that we also should reflect as PGA more than as we do it now at the moment. So thank you very much for, this, for, for bringing this on the table. Thank you, Petra. And finally, Fadi. Thank you. Um, just concerning the first question, um, well, what, what about the, the African Union, I, 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 try, I will try not to answer that question. I leave it to my uh, colleagues working in the African contexts um, to answer the question, but as far as the Arab League is concerned, I can definitely say this has never been a topic. I mean, it would never be raised. It would definitely not be on the agenda. I mean, if a lot of the, uh, a lot of the Middle Eastern and North African countries still um, uh, criminalize speaking about, I mean, in public, doing politics on LGBT issues, so that, I mean, it's, it's impossible for them to even put it on the agenda then. And that would be quite contradictory, um, so to speak. Um, so that would be, be my answer. Um, however, the only context where we have some sort of a, an encounter with the Arab League members um, is the Human Rights Council um, through so the, the submission of the UPR reports um, that happens from time to time. I mean, I think mostly only Lebanon and tu tu Tunisia have, have submitted UPR reports, I mean, LGBTI organizations on the violations against LGBTI people in those contexts. So that's always the only context where there is some discussion because, of course, it's the Human Rights Council, so we do have that space to bring up these issues and one cannot escape talking about them at least um, a little bit. Uh, so yes, that would be my answer. And I just want to make a quick remark um, concerning what uh, Ms. Um, Shirley Osborne said um, concerning the three men who were sent back because of not having, not being married or not having a wife. I mean, uh, I think that's also a problem that that, um, that it, it, the most, um, the biggest example of this was the Can Canadian case when they 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 bluntly said we're going to take only, you know, many people but not single straight men um, because they are potential terrorists or whatever. And here I want to refer to us, uh, Miss Anna Birchal. And sorry if I'm saying the name wrong. In in a in her speech earlier today uh, where she talked about the dangers um, of sometimes using security and anti-terrorism anti measures um, uh, in order to strip certain individuals of their rights. And I think that's one of those examples where we have to be a bit more careful um, with, with how that is um, sometimes implemented or used by certain states. So thank you. Thank you very much. I thank all the speakers and especially you for your interventions and we leave the space for the next panel.